Prova. Vi lascio l'apertura con i saluti istituzionali. ti dico bene 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 benvenuti a tutti vi ringrazio di essere welcome good morning thank you very much for uh, participating in the final event of the 5G Carmen digital corridor for the mobility of the future we are slightly late, so we will uh, straight, uh, start uh, straight away with the institutional addresses uh, with uh, the councillor uh, from uh, the province uh, of Trento, Achille Spinelli, and Francesco Profumo from the Bruno Kessler Foundation. Good morning and welcome at the Brenner. I represent here the autonomous province of Trento and uh, it is a pleasure and honor to be here today and to evidence uh, the will of this province to look at the future, look at the usage of technology in the light and in view of innovation and specifically digital innovation, which has always been a driving element uh, for our administration also in terms of investments in order to have a pragmatic and visible uh, development of technologies that can be helpful in our daily life. Being here today for the Digital Corridor is indeed one of the examples of this activity. We believe strongly in it. We believe strongly in it for our uh, province, for our region, uh, for mobility of the future, for the environment, for safety, of course. We need to invest in these elements, and uh, this project is indeed something that testifies to this will and action. I'm very happy that uh, the Bruno Kessler uh, uh, Foundation, represented here by uh, Francesco Profumo, but also by engineer Simone, has joined effort in this uh, project with a number of entities with a view of uh, enhancing the value of the work. It is an international project. The Munich-Bologna uh, corridor is the corridor we want to uh, work at and on because uh, it is the future. It is what really gives a positive uh, uh, vision of the future for the next generations as well. We are doing something which is uh, correct and we're doing something which is good uh, for the next generations as well. So congratulations on what you have achieved uh, so far. I'm sure that the future will continue bringing fruitful results. Uh, let's continue working together to achieve those results. Thank you very much. Good morning. My name is Francesco Profumo, and I here represent the Bruno Kessler Foundation, which has been the coordinating partner in this uh, important project, which has made it possible to uh, create the conditions to anticipate a number of things. You see, back in 2019, the uh, President of the European Commission, newly appointed uh, von der Leyen, started uh, her speech talking about uh, transitions. I remember that we were working at the very same concept and we underlined the fact that this was a valuable digital trans transition and transformation, but not only that. 
because we wanted uh, to make up for the lack of a corridor in the south of Europe, uh, which uh, was otherwise present elsewhere in the European Union. At the time, we managed to set up a very solid, robust partnership coordinated by a research entity, which is, again, the Bruno Kessler Foundation, and that was a significant uh, achievement. So, actually, we anticipated what uh, uh, the uh, president of the European Commission voiced uh, in her uh, speech about uh, ecologic, ecologic transition, digital transition, and a number of elements that have been the focus of our project as well. After a number of years, we realize that transitions actually unite into one transition only. You need to have environmental, ecological transition in addition to digital transition. And of course, there is a focus on skills, which is the third element of transition, which is social transition. I would say that this project, which is a research project, which takes place within the framework of Horizon 2020, today has um, gained in importance and in significance. This uh, has laid the basis for uh, the possibility to move from research to an infrastructural project. So these are the major successes achieved by the new Europe, which sees in research projects which can be sustainable over the course of time, and that means that they do not end with the end of the project in terms of its financing. The Bruno Kessler Foundation, of course, expresses all its gratitude to the province, and not only the province, but to all actors for what has been done. This is indeed the example of a major project which has achieved the results it has achieved thanks to the uh, joint activity that has been uh, deployed with one objective in mind, which was that and is that of uh, uh, reaching a development model that uh, should be uh, something that we can replicate and, of course, uh, implement. I would like, again, to thank uh, the Autonomous Province of Trento for supporting us so much in terms also of supporting the idea that research is fundamental to create uh, conditions for development. This project is, uh, testifies to that. We have uh, uh, created skills and competencies we have given the possibility to young people to test what they could in relation to these important topics. And we feel stronger today uh, in terms of research and in terms of the idea uh, of a project that uh, can uh, foster development starting from research. Thank you very much and enjoy the day, of course. If I may, I would like uh, to add uh, something. We are hosted by uh, A22, Autostrada del Brennero. So we thank very much Engineer Costa and A22 for hosting us, uh, for the work that they have uh, uh, always uh, t evidenced uh, in terms of being always on the cutting edge in terms of innovation. So we have yet another example. I also would like to add something because you see, at the beginning of the project, in the very initial phases, of course, we uh, talked extensively with Brussels. And initially, it was uh, not clear what the final shape of our common endeavor would, would be. And uh, the participation of uh, A22 was the element that triggered all the rest. Uh, because the fact that there is a, such a heavy traffic, which is also polluting today, uh, was the element that we wanted to focus on, because it is uh, uh, something that is in line uh, uh, and is actually a trade union in relation to the th three transitions uh, that I mentioned earlier on. So thank you very much also on my part uh, to uh, the A22 for participating. Thank you very much. Thank you for sharing uh, your remarks with us. 
Before introducing the first speaker, Jorge Pereira from the European Commission, because uh, um, Mr. Spinelli and Profumo have recalled the fact that this is an international uh, project uh, on the Munich Bologna corridor. Before uh, um, so giving the floor to the first uh, speaker, we would like to show to you a video about 5G Carmen, which uh, shows uh, the uh, uh, various cases and the results that have been achieved in the past uh, three years and a half. Automated driving will transform the notion of mobility. Commuting hours will be enjoyable and safe experiences. And our environment will benefit from decreased carbon emissions. This groundbreaking EU-funded project leverages on the 5G communication technology to connect all vehicles and facilitate their cooperation including connected and automated vehicles in the communications network. With a dedicated 600-kilometer corridor between Munich, Innsbruck and Bologna, 5G Carmen will promote a cooperative transportation system which can be replicated throughout the EU in liaison with other activities on 5G corridors. 5G coverage has already been deployed along the borders of Italy, Austria, Germany, which accommodates 80,000 daily transits. Full 5G coverage is planned for 2025 and will pave the way for the creation of a fully equipped 600-kilometre 5G smart vehicle corridor. To support its 5G Carmen use cases on connected and automated driving, 5G Carmen has deployed an architecture where vehicles can communicate with each other through vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle and vehicle-to-network communication technology, exploiting the 5G technologies deployed for the project. Through the 5G network and directly among vehicles, data collected by vehicles can be delivered to the different services hosted on the Mobile Edge Computing MEC, platforms. These platforms have been deployed with dedicated connections to minimize latency, thus bringing services close from a communications point of view to their users. The services in the MEC platform interact to provide the cooperative and connected autonomous mobility use cases piloted in 5G Carmen. These services are managed through an edge orchestration platform developed inside the project that also handles service continuity by speaking with other MECs in neighbouring countries. In this way, services running on MEC of neighbouring countries can be coordinated and information collected on one side of the border can reach the other side through 5G connectivity, allowing service continuity across countries. Moreover, the 5G mobile networks in the three countries have been enhanced with some evolved features, introducing fast network reselection to reduce the communication gap when crossing the border, and local breakout to keep communication latency under control, also when users are in roaming. Lane merging is a cooperative operation among the vehicles, done every time two lines merge into one. 5G Carmen has deployed a centralized service to coordinate lane merging, optimizing it to avoid congestion or even accidents. In order to have all necessary information for the system to work, an onboard software inside the car obtains several information and then sends it to the MEC via a 5G modem. In our case, the data is their speed, position and the blinker status. After reaching the 5G node of the mobile operator, data will travel to the MEC. We have three MECs, one per country. Each one consists of several elements that allow the coordination of the traffic. Advanced message queuing protocol broker allows fast and reliable communication between cars and MEC. It permits messages to be delivered to multiple services. The service of local dynamic map, SLDM, processes the received messages, combines them per geographical zone using quad-tree approach, and summarizes the requests of all relevant cars. 
The maneuvering service is the protocol that, with the info received previously, calculates the next actions for every car in the area. It coordinates their velocities, ensures that correct distance is kept, and allows space for a possible merge. The response router gets the coordination information and it separates it in messages for each car. Afterwards, the AMQP broker handles the sending of all messages to the receptive cars. The message arrives now to the cars involved in emerging. The speed from the two cars already in the highway is modified according to the information received, and the third car can safely merge in the most optimized way. This service allows a high reliability for zero error lane changing and is capable of handling high vehicle density. The cooperative lane merging assist is but only one of the possible uses for this system. In 5G Carmen architecture, connected vehicles share their information with both CV2X direct communication and using 5G technology that connects them with the MEC platforms deployed in the 5G Carmen infrastructure. Services in the MEC can merge the information collected from all connected vehicles with additional data information provided by road operators about traffic or specific road conditions, building a detailed and reliable representation of the context around each car. Through 5G, this context can be delivered to connected vehicles to extend their perception and provide awareness of events that are still beyond the visibility of a vehicle sensor. This follows a core principle of autonomous driving. In high levels of automation, a car needs to see beyond other cars. 5G connectivity with 5G Carmen is the solution to see beyond what sensors and individual drivers see, ensuring comfortable travel in any situation. For example, car following with the so-called extended perception ensures smooth speed adaption in case of slowdown maneuvers or cut in by other vehicles. 5G Link is supported by CV2X Direct Connectivity to ensure redundant communication between cars. In another example, when an emergency vehicle approaches, it can alert all preceding vehicles by communicating with services in the MEC. 5G Carmen promptly informs all road users along the corridor through its 5G infrastructure. Cars can automatically check free road space and change lanes, giving way to the emergency vehicle as it approaches. The 5G Carmen project will contribute to the evolution of connected and automated mobility in Europe. The 5G cellular network infrastructure, the 5G direct communication technology and automated driving will transform the future of cooperative transport, making the EU a leader in the reinvention of global transportation systems. Benissimo, grazie a tutti. Thank you. Thank you very much. I apologize, but uh, I forgot to tell you that there is a simultaneous translation uh, for uh, uh, translation into English and Italian if you need, and that is needed also uh, for the uh, speech uh, of, uh, by Jorge Pereira. Can, can you hear us? Yes, indeed. Perfect. OK. Can I... Thank you for being here, Jorge. And uh, welcome to the final event of IG Carmen. Oh, okay. okay, perfect. We are seeing your slide. Uh, please perfect. go on. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so very much. Uh, first of all, my sincere apologies for not being there with you. 
Unfortunately, due to an unforeseen conflict uh, with our evaluations, we are evaluating now not only the uh, SNS, but also the CF2 digital 5G corridors, it ended up not being possible. So again, my apologies. Uh, let me briefly address 5G for CAM, 5G for connected automated mobility, uh, in this final public event of the 5G Carmen project. You have already seen a compelling video of the achievements of the project. Very well done uh, video indeed. But let me highlight the European policies underlying the 5G for camp focus and also the next steps. So let me move forward. The European Commission launched in 2016 uh, the 5G Action Plan, uh, which was approved by the Member States with concrete goals in terms of trials and early deployment of 5G towards pervasive coverage by 2025, focusing on where people live and in major transport paths, and now full coverage by 2030. Uh, in, in the, the telecom package of September 2016, uh, there was also the European Gigabit Society uh, besides the 5G action plan. And then it was recognized that 5G requires broadband in terms of pervasive fiber availability, while also providing broadband. And this will be then uh, emphasized again in the new focus. Uh, as, a, as a response to the crisis generated by the pandemic, the community Commission reassessed the situation and established even more ambitious targets for 2030. So by 2030, all European households will be covered by a gigabit network with all populated areas covered by 5G. So again, here, 5G is part of the, gigabit, uh, the, the broadband uh, delivery. And at the same time, by 2030, there will be pan-European deployments of 5G corridors for connected automated mobility and advanced digital rail, rail operations, contributing both to road safety and Green Deal objectives. The 5G action plan, the revived 5G action plan, has now a longer-term objective under the digital agenda for Europe to achieve 5G everywhere by 2030. This requires an even more aggressive rollout uh, with broad geographic and sectorial focuses, but mainly addressing the, 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 least, the least covered, least populated areas. But why 5G? 5G is seen as a critical tool to deliver connected and automated mobility by increasing levels of, by allowing increasing levels of automation, but also by ensuring seamless service across Europe, even across borders. But why the focus on cross borders? Because these are the major challenges. The commission singled out this aspect because in urban areas, the market will deliver through strong competition, but that in remote areas, market might be too slow to act. So the investment was needed to address both the difficulty of the areas and the technological challenges associated with uh, continuity of service, but also to make sure that we can address the market failures in, in these regions. Let me now focus very briefly on the 5G for CAM cross-border corridors, which were a major effort, uh, represent a major effort to prepare the grounds for the subsequent deployment of 5G for CAM across all major transport paths. This picture shows you the, 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 the ongoing, still ongoing projects, uh, both from call one and call two across the, uh, the, the trans-European uh, transport networks. We see in white uh, the, the projects from uh, call two and in red, the projects from call one and 5G Carmen covers, as it was mentioned, the corridor from Munich to, to Bologna. Okay, focusing here now on the border areas in these countries. So the projects constitute a good sample of the trans-European transport network and uh, allow us to address specific uh, issues and specific difficulties that have to do with uh, regional and local 
characteristics in terms of deploying and availability of technology, but also in terms of the uh, involved uh, players, okay, which go beyond the DMNOs, the, the operators, to include also the vendors, uh, car manufacturers, but also the the the, the road road operators and the road authorities. We invested in this two calls over 105 million euros to address, as I said, the, the, the specificities and difficulties of these cross-border scenarios. On the way towards uh, 5G everywhere, uh, we have invested, as I said, 105 million euros on the rise in 2020, but now we aim at covering the full trend and spot network uh, by 2030. For that, we are going to invest around 1 billion euros under CEF2 Digital 5G corridors, to which you have to add additional public funding sources, both from regional and uh, uh, national uh, authorities. Uh, but besides that, private investments will be uh, essential to cover these areas. Uh, Remember that what the Commission intends to do through the SEF funding is to facilitate, to accelerate deployment in these areas where the market, as I said, uh, is, uh, has problems where return on investment will not, uh, will not uh, allow uh, the uh, operators to, to deploy as fast as we would like to. So, in, in conclusion, uh, in order to enable and, employ, and, and empower uh, 5G for CAM, uh, we are going to need to continue to have these distributed testbeds, which uh, the, the cross-border corridors constitute, to allow us to check to check uh, uh, the, the issues and problems that, that arise. As I mentioned, towards this 5G everywhere, the Commission has already invested over under the, uh, around 150 million euros in 5G PPP, under than five in the cross-border corridors, but also 45 additional million by uh, other projects for dealing with, with advanced mobility. And we now want to move towards, uh, in, in the context of self to digital to the actual deployment of 5G corridors, and we are putting there 1 billion euros. Uh, there are still many challenges ahead. self to digital focus on deployment, but we want to continue investing in research in this area under the new uh, framework program, the 6G SNS uh, activities. And with that, I, I leave you to to your to your to your meeting. And uh, but I remain available if there are any questions. Uh, uh, I, I will be here. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jorge. Thank you a lot. E ritorniamo all'Italia. Let's switch back to Italian. So we have here with us the CEO of Autostrade del Brennero, Mr. Diego Cattoni. We are uh, glad to have him here with us. Uh, and uh, uh, I'd like to thank him for hosting this meeting here in this nice facility. Thank you. So I'd like to thank uh, Councillor Spinelli and uh, Mr. Profumo. I'd also like to welcome all participants. So this is a very hot topic today, also considering the level of traffic uh, I, uh, there is at the moment on the motorway. So. Uh, this uh, analog, uh, so now we are driving in an analog fashion and we decide uh, when to do things. It is an imperfect order because it is based on personal decisions. So it is an incomplete order. Switching to a digital system, managing traffic uh, in a different way, in a more efficient way, going from the an, an analog um, organization, uh, an imperfect system to a much more perfect system. 
then of course uh, this is a, a, a great uh, solution also considering uh, also how much uh, uh, the uh, to what to the extent that traffic impacts our lives every day so I will talk, uh, so this is something that impacts uh, the um, Italian system, also Autostrade de Brennero. Some uh, days ago, there was a meeting in Lisbon, uh, ASACAP, the European Association uh, gathering all European operators, uh, Italian ISCAT, uh, uh, so uh, is a member and uh, we are members of this latter organization. So it, uh, so uh, all, there are many, uh, all European countries, uh, members, uh, all Europe up to uh, Russia. So digitalization, this is something which has been discussed everywhere in Europe. So a sensitive topic and Italy um, has uh, a leading edge here. So uh, especially compared to other countries, because we have projects that have already been implemented, whereas in other European countries, well, uh, uh, we are seen as a benchmark. Uh, we are very much admired. In Italy, we have uh, the Autobrennero project, and Autobrennero is uh, a leader, an innovator in a way. So we are discussing 5G, this small latency, almost non-existent, that enables autonomous driving, makes it uh, um, easier. So this is a really um, hot topic, and I'd like to Mm, conclude my introduction by reminding you uh, uh, that uh, uh, these are themes being discussed in Brussels and um, uh, also uh, Auto Brennero is uh, putting a lot of energy in this. Uh, so there is, uh, we have know how and the willingness uh, to, um, well, uh, 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 deep, uh, make uh, these future projects a reality. We are there, we are investing our knowledge, our money, and we are very determined to do something for the transnational corridor, for the country, for Europe. Uh, thank you so much for your attention. Well, let's now um, have a look at the main uh, results, uh, outcomes of the 5G Carmen project. So I will make a present the presentation together with Filippo, Roberto Vantini team and Filippo Vizentano from Stellantis. Well then, I will make, I will introduce very briefly the 5G Carmen project and then Mr. Vizintaner from Stellantis and Fantini uh, team will uh, um, give an overview of the main results of this project. Okay, so what is the goal of the 5G Corman project? So it wants to harness the concept of mobility corridors, that is corridors for future smart mobility to uh, move people and goods across Europe. So 5G is, uh, will be used as, as a, uh, an enabling technology to make this new concept of connected and automated mobility a reality. So the vehicles will no longer be um, something uh, used to move from uh, A to B. They will become a, small, a smart uh, environment to meet the requirements of the 2030 European Mobility Plan. So the Bologna-Munich corridor has a th total length of 600 kilometers. It connects uh, two major industrial uh, areas, uh, Munich, uh, cities Munich and Bologna, and it uh, runs through the three countries, Italy, Austria, and Germany. So 
uh, this uh, project includes national uh, test sites and uh, two cross-border test sites. We have tested there the technologies used in our project, which are here, the sites are here at the Brenner and close to Kufstein between Austria and Germany. So this project, well, is supported from the Euregio region, from Jokar uh, and the um, uh, innovation system of the Trentino region. So FPK project coordinator together with Deutsche Telekom uh, as a technical man manager have contributed to this project. So a lot of competencies and skills were necessary to make this to uh, develop this project. So, 25 partners from 10 European countries, uh, the f and then uh, the Bruno Kessler Foundation, University of Boats, and then car manufacturing companies, Stellantis, BMW, for example, and telecommunications companies such as Team, Deutsche Telekom, Magenta, and also other organizations that have contributed to the project infrastructure. So the project will end in July this year. Total cost 19 million euros. So what is the idea from which this project stems? So we want to have connected vehicles that are both in the digital and physical world. So we have an object, uh, so uh, they become, uh, they uh, evolve from a vehicle to move to a um, connected vehicle. So um, these uh, vehicles uh, use up the 5G ready platform and uses, uh, uh, well, supports the automotive um, system. So safety, safety is very important here. And um, these are just a few figures. So fatal car accidents, for example, the first one, and then other types of accidents on motorways. And it has been demonstrated that autonomous driving is much safer and can help avoid accidents and hazardous situations. In particular, this project provides a platform where vehicles are able to exchange information on speed, position, intended trajectories and maneuvers to, well, uh, enable automated um, and safe maneuvers. So in addition, well, lo normally drivers are limited in their ability to perceive the surrounding environment. And uh, another uh, important uh, achievement of this project, 5G Carmen project, is that it provides an extended perception of the surrounding environment so vehicles and infra the infrastructure can share the perception of the road. Thank you. Thank you, Matteo. Okay, good, good, good morning, Roberto Fantini, team. So, in order to achieve these goals, the first uh, problem we had to face as a carrier uh, was to provide 5G coverage, of course. This coverage was provided by team in Italy, Magenta in Austria, and Deutsche Telekom in Germany. So we cover some uh, parts of the corridor and then cross-border areas, uh, for example, uh, Kufstein and here at the Brenner. So what I'd like to stress in particular about this coverage is that it was uh, um, uh, it is based on the commercial network. I'd like to say this because this gives you an idea of the difficulty of deploying uh, the various scenarios in on a commercial network that has to support the users that they are paying to use this network after all. And then also, I'd like to, to stress the fact that what we will see today is feasible already with the networks we have today in place. It is feasible, of course, with some enhancements, of course. So we had to optimize, uh, introduce some optimizations because, uh, well, we know that uh, there are problems when you change operator. You move from one country to the other, you change operator. So you have to 
um, be able to support with the network a challenging scenarios. The first problem is when you cross the, the border. When you cross the border, then you uh, leave uh, the uh, national operator network and then uh, telephones, smartphones, uh, start searching for the new operator. It can this uh, process can last some seconds. Uh, so, for example, uh, at the beginning of the project, uh, we had even um, gaps of 96 seconds, and you see this on the left-hand side in the black part. So, areas where there was a disconnection, So, and this is not acceptable for this scenario. So, with the help of our technology partners and uh, through a close cooperation and information exchange with all other carriers, we have found the solution, the um, uh, uh, fast network reselection. What does it do? It accelerates the, re the selection, the reselection of the network. So we have uh, uh, reached a, a level of uh, uh, lower than one second. So we have only one uh, black spot, let's say, or you can see that below at the bottom of the picture on the right hand side. The impact on the network, of course, is much higher, and this is not possible, of course, cannot be supported by the existing commercial network. And then when you are in the new country, you have, you start your roaming, of course. The connection is a roaming connection. Um, when you are in a roaming mode, then data and traffic is always sent back home, so routed home. If you have an Italian SIM and I'm in Austria and I want to connect to an Austrian service, then my data goes back to Italy and then bounce back to Austria. This is a problem for the latency. What is latency at the time? A data package takes to cross the network to go from the vehicle call to the server it wants to connect to. If I, um, if the pack, pack, packet goes to Italy and then comes back, then it takes time. At the beginning, latency was hundreds of milliseconds, too much for an automotive scenario. So working with partners using features that are already there but are not usually deployed for, for practical reasons, uh, tariffs, uh, rates, uh, and legal uh, um, and privacy. We have introduced a local breakout. It sounds like a bad word, but what does it do? Uh, so uh, it enables traffic to remain the, in the uh, country it is generated in. So if I'm in Austria, traffic stays in Austria. It doesn't go back to Italy. So the latency time are more acceptable for a commercial 5G network below 20 milliseconds. So I'm an, uh, work for a carrier, so I don't want to uh, tell you all that we had to do to make these services possible. So we have created a quite complex architecture that you see streamlined here in this picture. I will not go into detail as to the various uh, boxes that you see. We have the vehicle talking to one another and talking with the 5G network. We have the 5G network, and then we have the control rooms of the road operator, the A22 Brenner. And we have the um, green square. This is a new element, a very important one for the 5G network. To MEC, it was mentioned earlier, um, the MEC or Edge platform. It is a server where you can host uh, the project services. It was uh, uh, created so as to have very low latencies, so they are very close to where the service is deployed. So the um, we uh, our services reside here on the servers, but we immediately understood that MEC of the various operate carriers had to be connected to ensure uh, service continuity because that was the big challenge of this project, uh, demonstrating that I can be in Italy, I can um, interact with the Italian MEC, I have the service, but when I go to uh, Austria, then the service comes with me. It is managed by uh, pl an orchestration platform that moves uh, that service from from the Italian server MEC to the Austrian one so that the service stays with me and still gives me localized information and relevant for the area I'm in. So, and that's all. And I'd like to hand over to Filippo and he will uh, well, tell us what uh, this means in practice. 
My name is Filippo Vizintano, Stellantis CRF, and I will um, uh, tell you about the de demo you are going to see. The demo uh, tells you what we have been doing for months now on a, a cross-border level, across the border. The border is a challenging environment, if you think, uh, in terms of autonomous driving that has to be assisted by supported by connectivity to have higher levels of automation so that you have a full understanding of the environment and obstacles represented by the vehicles and surrounding the vehicles and your vehicle so that the vehicle well, uh, carries out the uh, all maneuvers automatically and to make sure that it can take all the decisions needed to manage unexpected events. This is what we define a high level of automation, so managing unexpected events. So the vehicle needs to be able to understand what is happening close to it, perceived by the sensors, but also what is happening uh, mid-range, let's say, where sensors uh, which uh, cannot reach because it, it, think of a camera, for example, an obstacle can be seen if it is close by, but the camera cannot see what is beyond a vehicle. So 5G and communication, vehicle to vehicle communication enables a support, uh, and makes it possible to support a vehicle in this extended Perception And so in a cross-border scenario, no need to have continued your service. There was a gap, but it has been bridged. Is for this reason a challenging and was in, uh, for this reason a challenging environment. If you have breaks um, of one minute, for example, autonomous driving or assisted driving can no longer benefit from a perception beyond the uh, the sensor range, let's say. So we are going to show you our prototype vehicles. BMW and the partners are testing also these situations, also these scenarios also in Kufstein. So the demo will be uh, uh, referred to the Brenner, Brenner era. So you will see vehicles uh, connected to the 5G network, and then you will see um, uh, what we did in terms to guarantee redundancy of uh, communication. So we have automated sanction level four and level five automation. So these uh, features and functions enable um, you to manage unexpected situations, unlike 3D automated features and functions, um, because the 3D level, well, uh, as an automation that has to be supported by human intervention in unexpected situations. So level four and five is a higher automation, but it needs redundant channels. So there is a communication with the 5G network, but if there are uh, uh, fractions of seconds where you do not have a network three seconds reselection, there is st uh, still a communication between vehicles. This is a redundant channel, which is essential for automation. And then there is the user interface, of course, that enables uh, you to um, have a general overview of the situation. We can show um, automated features. Well, of course, we are on a public road. Uh, some function uh, concerning lateral uh, control will be um, supported by the human, by the driver. So the driver will be supported. The driver will be given an advice. So this is a high level overview. So we have the onboard unit, the V2X unit integrating the 5G module. It is a direct communication um, module. Uh, this was uh, developed by Qualcomm. We have a service that is enabling high precision localization of the vehicle because it is important to have a precise positioning of the vehicle in the lane where the other vehicles are as well. And this is was possible thanks to Deutsche Telekom, Telekom using a 5G Corman network. And then we have the module developed by Stellantis CRF, the prototype unit enabling using a combination of sensor-based data and connectivity-based data 
uh, enables the um, longitudinal control and uh, lateral control of the vehicle. So the main concept that you will see in the demo is extend the perception. Extend the perception, well, is enabled by the vehicle sensors, and this is state of the art. You have the radar unit, the camera, and then also through communication. So the other equipped vehicle or vehicles will provide their information on their trajectory, uh, position, and uh, speed. And then this is the real uh, what what makes the dif uh, makes a difference. Uh, um, why this project makes a difference. So the other vehicles, um, trucks, for example, non-equipped trucks uh, or uh, non-equipped vehicles, uh, pedestrians, for example, because also you know, in parking lots, for example, are perceived by the preceding vehicles and preceding vehicles when we don't see them, and the information is transferred to the vehicle following. So you have, uh, thanks to the fact you the same data transmission frequency than the frequency of the updating for sensor perception. So if the sensor perceives uh, 20 uh, times per second an obstacle, then the 5G uh, transmits uh, this information 20 times per second. Uh, so the vehicle behind can see, let's say, perceive the obstacle, which is uh, very much ahead with the same frequency. So the 5G, thanks to the 5G, communication is no longer a bottleneck for data transmission. This is the real added value provided by the project, by the 5G technology, and which we will see today. So during the pilot, we will measure this performance or in terms of vehicle perception, and we will show you some applications where and we will see that thanks to this extended perception, vehicles can a smoother uh, speed profile, can perceive other non-equipped vehicles because not all vehicles will be equipped with this connectivity technology in the near future. So they are able to perceive the trucks very, very far away. And they will also uh, be able to leave space for merging vehicles. These are the use cases, well, um, uh, uh, lane change and um, uh, uh, lane keeping in a cooperative, adaptive, adaptive cruise control function feature, a feature that enables, uh, 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 keeps uh, the safe, uh, the um, safety distance from the preceding vehicle. That's all. Perfetto, grazie. Continuiamo con... Wonderful. So we now continue with a contribution by engineer Carlo Costa uh, from Autostrada del Brennero. He's the general technical director at A22. Good, of, good morning, also on my part. It is still morning. Good morning. So uh, this is a very useful opportunity to present to you uh, our, the investment made by Auto Brenner in relation to the vision of the future. We think in terms uh, of a, a motorway which is uh, on the uh, one of the most important corridors in between uh, the center of Europe and the Mediterranean area. The uh, infrastructures were uh, created uh, 50 years ago, 30 kilometers of viaduct uh, and many uh, tunnels uh, from uh, Bolzano to Brenner. Um, and uh, this uh, makes it clear how complex uh, the situation is. It is not simply a question of building uh, new roads uh, or motorways. It is much more complex than that. In addition to that, 
uh, there is also a cultural element to be considered because here you see the fleet uh, in 2019 on uh, A22 um, and uh, this Italy is the country with the highest number of vehicles per number of inhabitants in Italy and you see uh, that uh, um, we have increased by more than 115 times the number of cars uh, in uh, Italy in the past uh, 70 years. We have 40 million cars now. What is of specific interest is the development of road transport because we are used to the uh, concept of planning our uh, traveling uh, options, but not when we drive a car. We know when we uh, want to travel by train what we have to do, and the same goes for boarding a plane. We even uh, um, buy tickets for cinemas in advance, but that does not apply to cars. Uh, we simply get in a car and think that we can gain access to all possible mobility offers uh, uh, straight away with no issues uh, whatsoever. So uh, uh, this is a concept that has to be overcome and improved. Uh, we all come from this uh, uh, history, this past. In the past, cars were a status symbol, and this is no longer the case, so should not uh, be the case uh, any longer. Uh, they should not be objects that you own, but something that you share. These are the elements uh, that we have to work out in relation uh, of mon- to managing mobility of the future. Now, uh, with the 5G Carmen and also with other projects, uh, we uh, want to pursue uh, precisely that uh, goal. You see, there is uh, some resistance uh, against uh, this type of testing in the world of mobility. The idea of moving from individual mobility as a system whereby we are all individually using our cars uh, to an orderly and regulated traffic is something which is a major change. Uh, There you see ants, uh, and uh, I put uh, that animal there because I want to um, symbolize the fact that we uh, all move in one direction with the same goal. Uh, Digital mobility on demand and cooperative mobility um, leads uh, to a better usage of the vehicle itself. Uh, um, You see, by now, uh, all cars have sensors and systems on board which uh, permit uh, to receive and uh, transmit information. The problem is that there are no platforms uh, to collect and exchange and manage uh, those pieces of information in order to use them at best. So the infrastructure will be uh, key. Uh, the car will no longer be the focus, but the infrastructure will. In relation to um, safety and the environment, uh, uh, President uh, Frofumo earlier on said that this project, in order to be um, supported by the European Commission, have to have a part which is specifically dedicated to the environment and to safety. And uh, uh, you see, we did very much in that respect because uh, We know that there are several aspects to be considered in relation to the environment, but also to the economy. The point always being that of having a win-win situation where the environment is preserved, mobility is facilitated, and uh, everything runs smoothly. This is what the CITS system should uh, achieve. Uh, In order to uh, get there to these cooperative systems, what we need to have are a number of uh, features uh, being, first of all, the fact that there is full coverage of the service and what has been said earlier on about uh, cross-border systems uh, should be applied extensively. You have to have a seamless uh, system, otherwise uh, you will have a limitation that you cannot overcome. And this uh, is something which should be generally provided. This goes beyond individual and vested interests of operators. In addition to that, uh, we need to have a free access. Only by doing this will be will we be able to achieve the, the results that we want to achieve. Here you have a number of figures. 1.3 for 35 million people die uh, due to car accident every year in the world. It is a, a, a carnage. So. Uh, it, it, it's unacceptable. 3,000 people in Italy only. Um, you see that uh, 
there is also uh, the fact that uh, roadworks uh, uh, make out uh, a sh- a share of these accidents. These are accidents uh, uh, which uh, are uh, linked to the individual case uh, and uh, in, in individuals, uh, single drivers, uh, might be uh, lacking attention in that moment or they are poor drivers uh, and uh, so they are responsible uh, to for many for many accidents uh, uh, this is something uh, which is detrimental for the system the system has to uh, try and counter that individual uh, prob- problem uh, we worked on that in order also to improve uh, traffic flows in order to reduce accidents and in order to reduce uh, the environmental impact uh, this is something uh, that uh, we did uh, with our project uh, which uh, showed uh, that uh, in the moment when you have co- Cooperative processes, uh, the um, accident rate reduces the levels uh, of uh, um, emissions uh, into the environment are reduced heavily, and also uh, um, the duration of the travel is shortened, which means that we want to use more innovative technologies in order to increase the level of safety, and we want to uh, also respect the environment and the areas. This, of course, uh, fits uh, very well with the 5G common project, because the idea of having connectivity which can manage data at best uh, requires that you have a fiber uh, along uh, the entire uh, uh, section and uh, that is not sufficient actually the uh, this project that I mentioned earlier on in relation uh, to uh, the management uh, of data for individual vehicles uh, presupposed already that uh, you would have a digital uh, motorway and that you would uh, uh, favor the um, connection, which is what we did with the short uh, communication and long communication using different uh, technology, uh, including mobiles in the latter case. This is what we did. The 5G technology, of course, improves uh, the overall process, makes it more reliable so that we have a very low latency, so that we improve coverage, and uh, we also make up in this way uh, to make up for the fact uh, that uh, you um, deploy uh, a technology which makes a cost of, a cost of feasible and you have a seamless system, as I said. Another important uh, thing, uh, which is also part uh, of uh, our proposal for the renewal of the concession agreement, uh, is the fact of having a platform which integrates uh, different transport systems. We want in the future to provide a service which is uh, simply effective, with no competition uh, with, uh, between one service and the other. We should not have a competition between individual mobility using cars cars and collective mobility uh, in trains uh, and uh, on planes. Uh, We have to join efforts. This is indeed uh, one of the ideas that we uh, brought forward, Uh, the idea being that of uh, having a motorway which is uh, um, an intermodal hub. Uh, Having said that, I would add that this work that we have performed over the course of time uh, always went uh, in the uh, direction of innovation. You are never sure about what uh, uh, you can achieve, of course, uh, when you start, but unless you start making the first step, you will never uh, get anywhere. Thank you very much. Thank you, Engineer Costa. We now continue with uh, Mauro Boldi, who is responsible for the international project uh, at uh, TEAM, and he will address us on the mobility of the future. Good morning. My name is Mauro Boldi. I'm in charge uh, of uh, European project for uh, the innovation in Europe.
Appunto, come detto prima, sono Mauro Boldi. As I said, my name is Mauro Boldi. I'm in charge of European project for the innovative sector or at Team Italy. And I will do without the slide. So I will speak off the cuff and I will speak about the role that we have had in this project and the perspectives and prospects for the future in line with the project. But let's mention a few facts about our past. Uh, I started working at this project in 2018 uh, when, thanks uh, to the cooperation and collaboration with Mr. Profumo and with uh, Engineer Bagnasco at the time in charge of innovation, with uh, Engineer Ferrigo, who at present is at Imueta, um, so with them, we started basically the project, and it was indeed an adventure. It was not easy. Uh, we know that starting the 5G Carmen project and then deploying it has not been easy. Uh, it was so because four to five years ago, the situation was very different from today. 5G was something that was part of the future. Now we're already speaking of 6G. At the time, 5G did not exist. We could not think of installing towers for 5G because there were no radio stations for 5G. Nobody had them which gives you an idea about uh, the extent to which a uh, 5G Carmen um, was a cutting edge project. At the time, we had only the device to device option and field, which was very specific in standardization. You know that a 3GPP is the entity behind uh, this. And that made it possible to have mobiles calling each other without connecting to the operator network. Clearly, we did not like that very much uh, as a company. While the V2V communication, not only within the framework of PC5, which is the communication channel connecting vehicles directly without using the network, that communication, uh, on, on the other hand, was interesting uh, for us as well. Uh, the 5G Common project made it possible for us to interact with the verticals, as we called them from the very beginning. What are verticals for Telecom Italia? They are the players that in the past years have uh, harnessed the potentials of 5G and that could not do that with 4G simply because 4G was a, a radio mobile telecommunication system uh, based on the broadband uh, which meant enhancing communication possibilities uh, and that was it. It was a success indeed. The um, larger uh, and pervasive presence of um, mobiles uh, and smartphones depends on that. 5G, as it was started basically uh, four or five years ago, had as a goal the digitalization of the world, which meant for an operator, for a company such as ours, uh, to uh, interact with other players, different players, which would use new functions, uh, uh, which also includes low latency, which is something that previous speakers uh, mentioned already. What does low latency mean? It means that you can have a vehicles communicate almost uh, in real time. Uh, the time range is a few milliseconds. If there is this latency, a uh, delay basically of uh, milliseconds, uh, we can then deploy uh, applications that uh, prevent accidents, uh, that makes it possible to have uh, smoother maneuvers, uh, or even to tell the cars before you uh, to 
activate your braking system. And I saw that yesterday. I had an anticipation of the demo, uh, and I was really impressed. You will understand what I mean when you uh, participate in the demo later on. For us, 5G Carmen has been an opportunity to make research with new players and to open up new markets, which are very important to us because by now we are no longer the company that makes it possible for people to make a telephone call, but we are, as our previous uh, slogan went, uh, we went beyond uh, connectivity. That was our slogan. This is what we actually did. 5G Carmen is not a connectivity project. It's not simply that we installed towers uh, just with a view of having uh, uh, passing by vehicles uh, uh, be connected with, uh, to the network. Uh, that is something that could be done also earlier on. We did something else. We did something but that was challenging because you see um, connecting two clouds, one being in uh, Austria and Germany and the other one being in Italy is something that simply was not part of our uh, skills. It was something that we could not do until a few years ago. Thanks to the 5G Carmen, that has changed. And uh, we are from now on, but also were in the past, interested in all automotive uh, 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 sector activities. We are in the Chirosa, C. Rosa uh, project as well. And uh, we also tried uh, to find a solution between the CDS and the 5G uh, solutions uh, over the years. And of course, uh, we wanted to mm, push 5G also for the reasons mentioned by Mr. Vizentina, because with 5G, we really have an implementation of uh, the uh, uh, communications from vehicles uh, to uh, the network and vice versa. Uh, this is something that was possible only with uh, the 5G. We do that with 5G Carmen, C roads. Uh, we will do that with the additional projects uh, that will be made if uh, this activity continues, uh, also in terms of deployment on the 822 uh, motorway, as we all hope, of course. So what you see is the outcome of a research project which serves as a milestone, and it is also the starting point uh, towards uh, deployment and commercial deployment solutions for the forthcoming years. Again, I apologize uh, for not sharing my slides uh, with you, but I hope that my speech was uh, uh, interesting enough and especially clear enough in terms of explaining why Tim has been part of this project. Okay, so now we have uh, Mr. Marco Vassallo in charge of, uh, well, um, innovation manager te uh, team, uh, innovation team manager for Stellantis. He will talk about 5G and the mobility of the future. Good uh, morning, Bob Half. Um, and uh, with my presentation, I'd like to tell you how we think that uh, 5G technology can change the future of mobility. Um, it is a future which is closer and closer. It is not as far from us uh, as when the project started in 2017. And Mr. Boldi said that uh, at that time we didn't have 5G technology. Thanks to 5G, then um, the pro we could start uh, uh, with the project that uh, uh, could uh, employ all the new uh, the enhancements and so on. Well, now we are already talking about about 6G. Maybe there will be a 6G Carmen project. So. As uh, Stellantis, formerly uh, Fiat Chrysler, we mm, have always wanted mm, to uh, meet challenges arising from change. And now these change or changes are uh, associated with electrification, pushed and driven by also from the European Union, uh, the, 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 
uh, driven by the, the challenge of uh, uh, decreasing environmental amp impact, therefore giving up uh, uh, combustion engines, uh, then automated driving and the connectivity, of course, which is very important. Uh, let's see how the, former, uh, the, the first two interact with the third. So electrification technologies need to um, uh, work properly, operate pro in all countries, and have to, of course, cater for the needs of consumers. Consumers who are different from country to country, and uh, connectivity enables uh, companies to provide services that were not necess necessary in the past. For example, the possibility of recharging your um, car anywhere or um, looking for the best route uh, uh, to save um, electric energy. So, and this has an impact on electrification, of course. It has a, a the greater impact on autonomous driving. So uh, going uh, so from L1 to L5, so this shift, uh, this uh, um, evolution has been made possible uh, through connectivity. So the L3 system will be the first watershed between the all mobility and the completely automated mobility in the hardware architecture and the software on board the car will need to um, enable complex uh, uh, maneuvers uh, full in a fully automated fashion and also able to manage the car in emergency situations, unexpected situations where the driver cannot intervene fast enough. So the system has to um, uh, uh, drive the car, autonomously drive the car um, to, the, on the, to the side of the road. So even at uh, L3 and L4 level, we should uh, try and uh, implement this, then, of course, uh, automated system require, well, in, involve a um, higher complexity on board of the car and also a higher complexity of the procedures to be implemented to validate the functioning. Because, of course, and you need to be able to test and uh, um, evaluate what can happen in uh, a high number of scenarios, and these are essential for the validation of the system, for validating the system. And such a complex system, of course, require um, a certain timing and costs that are higher than with a traditional car. This is a big challenge for uh, car manufacturers. However, if we look at what the world is offering, well, you see that uh, the internet is highly pervasive and that uh, new technologies are being invented and introduced. And so this enables us to uh, uh, offer products and services that are completely different than what was offered before. So even the lower level cars and now have uh, connectivity that were unheard of some some years ago. Even an A class um, car has uh, is equipped um, with feature has features as equipment that was unheard of some years ago. So connectivity enables this paradigm shift in mobility uh, for mobility so and anything we do even if you want to uh, buy a train ticket or a, a, a so you use connectivity you use the net uh, networks and this is something that will become more and more widespread in everyday mobility. So as to mobility in general, we certainly need that this mobility becomes more and more sustainable because what we expect from the European or national regulators that will um, uh, well, uh, devise future strategies, well, they of course, need um, uh, well uh, will give 
strategic will they will give strategic guidelines to uh, decrease the impact of mobility so and we will have to react to these guidelines and we'll have of course to comply with the constraints of the regulations new regulations the 5g network offers unprecedented performance and features I don't want to go into detail as to the as to coverage level uh, speed of uh, data transfer and so on and so forth uh, so uh, ongoing uh, round the clock uh, connectivity so uh, these are uh, uh, considered now maybe seen as magic features but what we have seen in this project with this project is that they can really be implemented and they can really have a huge impact on the uh, mobility of the future so as somebody said earlier this will certainly impact have impact on uh, the efficiency of mobility in terms of energy consumption but will certainly have a huge impact in terms of safety because if you can have a car that um, or a, a driver a car that sees uh, not only what the sensor perceives or the camera perceives, but what other vehicles on the road can see, well, this is a factor that will certainly increase the uh, level of safety of cars and vehicles in general. This is what we have seen over the years with, with, the, uh, with this 5G uh, project. The, Partners' contribution, this is one of the advantages of European projects. So partners such as the Bruno Kessler Foundation, uh, which was responsible for development, and then what we received from the A22 uh, motorway. Mm, so so we they provide the test bench 600 kilometers from Bologna to Brenner to the Brenner so this enabled us to test the car on the road uh, in a traffic situation so a European project such as this one is probably the only way that enables you to have a large scale testing phase before, uh, well, of course, uh, um, rolling out the system. So this is, so now the challenge is uh, going from uh, what we have developed uh, in the test phase, in the lab, uh, in, in on road test, uh, and, and move these to uh, standard vehicles. So 5G is fundamental. Without 5G, this is impossible. It was impossible with the previous systems. This is why we uh, are part of the associations such, such as the 5G Automotive Association, because in our opinion, also associ uh, associations that help standardize uh, data exchange protocols uh, should uh, uh, contribute. So without them, this would not be able because we have to have a standard environment and you, can, uh, you cannot create a standardized environment uh, just working alone. So I'd like to thank again the Bruno Kessler Foundation the host for today's event, and they have really been a fundamental partner for this project. Thanks a lot. And it is a pleasure for me to introduce Professor Vito Mauro. He represents uh, the representative of the Minister for Infrastructure and uh, Transport and uh, Sustainable Mobility. Well, I hope you can hear me. And good morning. I'm sorry, but I couldn't uh, come on site. So I would like to start by, um, well, uh, uh, well, bringing to you uh, um, some greeting words from Minister Giovannini, so he could not uh, take part in this uh, event. So, and I'd like to really um, share with you my compliments for the work you have uh, 
carried out. So this research activity, this coordination, cooperation activity um, has been fundamental for uh, the future of mobility. So our role, the role of our ministry, so we are not um, the Ministry of Research. We need to be able to use the the, the results of research work as timely as possible. What does it mean? And we will go back to this later. This means creating the enabling conditions so that innovation can really um, um, have effects and show its effects. And that's why we have been interested for some time now um, to see uh, what the if effects of mobility of connectivity can have on mobility in general we are interested in everything um, is being do uh, as is being done at European Center on the CCA at the CCAM level so Co cooperative connected mobility. Why are we interested in this? We want to improve the safety and efficiency of traffic and mobility in general, and we'd also like to improve resiliency of infrastructures. And we believe that all these technologies can really contribute to, to this, to, to this improvement. I need to uh, repeat some things that have already been said. We still have uh, 3,000 deaths per year because of traffic accidents, and this uh, Number we are not we are, do, do not manage to um, decrease it. So in the next ten years we aim at halving this. So we were able to decrease this number in the decade between 2010 2020. We were not able to do it, and it will be difficult to decrease the number uh, in the next decade 2020 2030. So the Ministry of Infrastructure and sustainable uh, mobility, of course, because we seem as an interest in this. So we are really interested. Uh, so uh, we want so you were mentioning 2017 as uh, the year where uh, the 5G requirement project began um, in uh, 2016, 2017, together with all national stakeholders, we defined the smart pro um, decree, smart road decree which laid the foundations for the infrastructure digitalization development and digitalization of mobility. Then decree 70, 2018, laying, uh, lay, um, laying down the uh, main principles and decrees for the building of roads, and um, it created these observatory for transitions uh, within the ministry. So I'm, I'm part of it. Something has happened, actually. Well, uh, not all that we had uh, we had hoped for, but uh, you have mentioned all the experiences and tests uh, made on the A22, you um, uh, the TS services, then this project, uh, 5G Corman project, which has proved uh, the uh, effects of uh, uh, the 5G when correctly applied uh, to connectivity. In the decree, we were a bit too optimistic because we had set 2025 as uh, the year where CSDS uh, 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 um, services would be uh, active on uh, at a, uh, nationwide, but in Italy, of course. But we uh, there is a delay. Uh, well, uh, some of you mentioned the uh, conflict between the or the, 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 the fight between the various technologies of 4G, uh, 6G and so on, 5G, but we have uh, um, already have some prototypes uh, in this country uh, uh, besides the brand new one that Anas has uh, introduced the Smart Road uh, project, so they are not so far away. So then the Alemania uh, um, uh, Road, then Cortina, then the Rome uh, Fiumicino stretch. If you return an airport stretch, then almost all operators, Italian road operators, have very ambitious uh, plans in this area. On, so 
what can the ministry do then? What can we do? What do we want to do? We want to interact with everybody so as to create a playing field and the enabling conditions. And this means we need to understand whether laws, regulations are needed. Um, understanding how we can, um, where we can direct funds, and we have the resiliency plan, the national um, recovery and resiliency plan. There are some, uh, so some some of these projects that will be funded with these funds need uh, well require the development of prototypes at a national level. So it is at the right time to. Uh, start again this idea of the development of uh, service and uh, national service platforms for connectivity, in particular for CITS. For CITS. Why are we so interested in um, connectivity services for mobility and traffic? Because all studies say that there is a three to one cost benefit uh, ratio or uh, relationship, and uh, especially diffuse costs. Uh, uh, so the cost of infrastructure. Uh, is not huge, so this is something that can be done and will be very useful. But we have, we need to work together to do this uh, to uh, accomplish something. We should uh, go beyond uh, this idea of uh, locally developed prototypes. So we should uh, really um, put in place a shared uh, scenario that, of course, includes uh, uh, technological evolution, but something that also involves interaction at uh, the understanding of business models, interaction models. Uh, for example, uh, Vito Mauro is in his car and wants to use some services, and so we need to understand what, how this can be possible. So we should uh, then uh, share this scenario, have uh, everybody understand this scenario so that, the, that then various players can decide uh, uh, what to do in business terms. And so also central authorities uh, 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 will then be able to do what they can to facilitate uh, these projects. Uh, this. So, for example, extending these platforms uh, that you started creating with MACs and information brokers. We could see whether this is applicable at a national level. Maybe there can be, uh, we should uh, understand whether a contribution is uh, necessary in terms of um, money worth. So private companies cannot, um, are not enough, uh, or have not, do not have in, uh, enough. So then competence, uh, knowledge, skills, uh, they are there. We are mature from this, a mature country from this viewpoint, but there are also opportunities are there because we do have pilot projects. Then uh, we m mentioned mass. Mass is a similar um, area. Even in mass, you need to um, uh, focus on interoperability between various players, various uh, private uh, platforms addressed to end users. And there, we are managing to create a minimum basis because in the mass uh, area, we already have developed a project, but our ministry, together with the Ministry of Digital Transition, acts as an enabler and facilitators uh, through the creation of the, the, the through the, put, uh, the, the implementation of pro, uh, platform, B2B platform. To, uh, for um, mass operators, transport operators, to ensure uh, interoperability. So, to conclude, we are ready to support this effort. We'd like to do it together with all the various entities, bodies, uh, and organizations involving uh, tele uh, the, the road operators, uh, car makers, uh, and, and, and uh, the technical partners, uh, so that uh, we can include not only motorways, but also the urban environment, the urban traffic, so which is a problem in terms of uh, sustainable mobility. We hope we'll be able to create a framework to work together as uh, soon as possible. Thanks, thanks uh, to your efforts, and uh, 5G Carmen is a uh, Beautiful example. Then we do have the skills, the tools, the prerequisites, and so we're ready. Thanks a lot.
Grazie mille. Thank you. Thank you for attending and speaking to us. That was the last contribution for our meeting because we now open the round table moderated by Marco Pistore uh, from the Bruno Kessler Foundation. We then have uh, Andrea Mondo from Inwit, uh, connected remotely, and uh, Cla Mr. Klaus Pahl from the Free University of Bolzano. Alessio Beltrame from the Ugo Bodoni Foundation is also a panelist. Uh, we were supposed also to have Giuseppe Neri, director of Swarco, unfortunately could not make it today. So these are the panelists. Thank you. Thank you, Matteo. I see that uh, Mr. Mondo is connected. Uh, there you are. Good morning. Or rather, good afternoon. My task is that uh, of uh, uh, being brief, uh, if possible, so that you can have your lunch and then or participate in on the in the on the road demo. Uh, so I kindly invite all speakers uh, to be brief. Uh, we have received already so much information. Let's continue providing information, but uh, without dwelling at length on things. Uh, the Bruno Kessler Foundation has had a very important role in the 5G, Carmen, and very happy to see the results of the project. Uh, the Digital Societies Center has the task of bringing the digital technologies uh, uh, come to uh, the communities and be part of the daily life of communities. And we have seen already so many things in 5G, Carmen, that makes us very hopeful for the future and for this deployment. Before talking about the future, Let's start with the first round of table, and I would kindly ask the panelists to tell us about what has been done in the past, therefore, and especially um, the information about the decision made within 5G Carmen, which was that of making research using the existing infrastructures and also in weather conditions that were not always ideal. Uh, using the commercial infrastructure that was there, which was not theoretical. We did not work in a lab. We worked uh, on the field uh, so, and in the field. So uh, that, that, that is what I would like to start with and from. And uh, the first speaker will be Alessio Beltrame from uh, the Ugo Bordoni Foundation. He's in charge of innovation and development there. And the foundation supports uh, um, local administrations and public administrations in general. Uh, in supporting uh, uh, them uh, with knowledge about uh, digital technology. So public uh, government and administrations uh, uh, receive this digital support thanks to the work uh, performed at the Ugo Bordoni Foundation. What do you think about the uh, 5G camera in terms of the main goals uh, and results also? What about this idea of bringing together uh, um, the uh, research and uh, the practical and already existing infrastructure? Thank you very much for inviting me, first and foremost. Our foundation has been an observer, actually, of the project. And with the Ministry for Economic Development, we have uh, already, um, we have of course uh, seen uh, to all uh, projects and experiments per pertaining to 5G. Within 5G, experiment and research play a fundamental role in preparing future deployment. This is something that emerged very clearly here this morning. You told about the problems uh, uh, found and tackled. This, of course, paves the way to the tackling of the challenges ahead, because this project has not covered all aspects. It has been said there are still aspects which need to be analyzed in order to get to a deployable project, an executive uh, project. The Commission uh, told us that we needed to hurry up. 
we need to be very fast. We need to run. And I really believe that the main positive aspect of this project, leaving all technological aspects aside, is the fact that the project has brought together all actors in the field, all stakeholders, all those who are involved in the uh, sector of mobility. Clearly, if uh, actors uh, are not fully represented, you will never have something that you can really deploy. 5G is peculiar in that respect. 4G, it has been said, meant connectivity a huge availability of data and making that available to everybody. While 5G is more selective and uh, it works with the verticals, as it has been said, this is the one vertical mobility. But in general, we also talk about uh, port, airport, uh, railway stations, and then farming, tourism, uh, smart cities, industries, factories, the manufacturing sector, there are several uh, verticals uh, where the involvement of the other stakeholders is key. In order to meet objectives, 5G needs to cover a number of complex issues, which also require huge investments, which differ depending on the type of service that I want to achieve. If I use assisted uh, uh, level four and five driving, which is fully automated driving, you need to have a thorough infrastructure. You need new uh, towers. Uh, the edge computing has to be as close as possible to the place where data is generated because you need to make decisions immediately after analyzing huge quantities of data in order to be safe. So the edge computer has to be very far, very close, sorry. And this has to be multiplied uh, for all sectors that I mentioned, which entails investment. Telecommunication operators in general have been asked to invest in connectivity. So the question is, are they enough? Do they suffice in relation to the uh, infrastructures uh, that have to be built, investments that are required by that? I think that we need to involve a broader group, including those who have concession agreements for the infrastructures, the operators, therefore, of infrastructures, and all those uh, who have a vested interest in making uh, this operational and fast. The challenging objectives have been voiced by the representative of the European Commission. And I would also like to recall what Mr. Profumo said uh, when talking about the need to bring together several entities, uh, connectivity, transition, uh, a transition which needs uh, to move in a, a sustainable direction, so towards sustainability. That is the slogan. And uh, we also have uh, the accountability and responsibility responsibility of uh, uh, state uh, and public entities, which have, of course, therefore, to be involved. This is what 5G stands for, uh, 5G Carmen, sorry, stands for. And I think that that was the key uh, positive feature. Thank you, Alessio. Thank you for uh, recalling the need to involve all actors uh, in uh, the supply chain, so to say. And uh, we do have all actors uh, here today at this table. We have two representatives of the supply chain uh, at the very edges. One person coming from the academic world, and uh, uh, then uh, the representative of uh, Inwit uh, that uh, manages uh, the towers, uh, the antennas, and uh, that uh, I that, uh, therefore hosts uh, this uh, technology. We now start with Andrea Mondo uh, from uh, Inwit. Uh, he will uh, address us on the aspects that are kind of fundamental in order to have a, f a 5G Carmen uh, work. Uh, I would like you to uh, comment on what uh, Alessio Bertrame said and uh, also on the uh, thing that I said, the fact that we performed research using actual uh, infrastructure. Well, good, good afternoon. I'm very happy to, to be with you, uh, albeit uh, remotely. 
what Dr. Beltrami said is absolutely correct. We speak about ultra-broadband uh, and the deployment of optic fiber and 5G, which means enable enabling element behind a digital transformation, which is a pre-requirement uh, for uh, digital revolution transformation. The point now is how uh, enablers uh, can uh, become practical entities. What we uh, talk about today is an extremely important uh, uh, case, uh, which I hope will set an example for industrial development in the future. What was uh, an issue of technological readiness until a few years ago uh, by now has been uh, solved as an issue, or at least it is being solved. The point now is to see how the various verticals will uh, make the investment possible to achieve a real digital transformation. There are several players in this. We feel to be an enabling entity behind the transformation and transition because we are present throughout uh, geographically and also because we are present where communities and where manufacturing entities are. Are. We need to uh, develop ad hoc investments and use cases dependent, depending on where you act. Today, uh, or to, uh, today, uh, an enabler today in terms of uh, communication and data will be tomorrow an enabler of the digital communication. This entails uh, having the right sensors, having the right devices, equipment, and here I agree with uh, what Mr. Beltrame said in relation to edge computing. Um, we will have uh, to make decisions about locations there based on uh, the local specificity. This is not only uh, an industrial uh, change. Uh, uh, industry 4.0 is what we talk about, automated industry and uh, remote management supply logistics, uh, supply logistics uh, and uh, uh, management uh, of uh, local specificities. We have uh, drones that are uh, enabled on the towers and that make it possible for us uh, to control an area. And uh, we also have uh, to supervise the environment. So these are all the elements that make it clear that you have uh, to make a specific investment depending on the local use case. Uh, 5G is an enabling element, uh, but you also need to bring the optic fiber to the tower. And uh, um, the next step will be that of uh, developing use cases to develop uh, the digital transformation, which is not only uh, limited to the industrial sector, uh, also socio-cultural element will have to be transformed and will have to be there in addition to having uh, to address uh, the environmental aspect, uh, and this goes with uh, sustainability, we will need to change our habits, and this has to do with culture. So I agree entirely with what Mr. Beltrame said. Thanks a lot. So. Let's uh, go to the other end of this uh, virtual uh, supply chain represented here, in particular, Professor Klaus Pahl. Thank you very much for being here. Klaus is uh, the Dean of the Faculty of um, uh, IT Technologies and Sciences, and together with the Bruno Kessler Foundation, the Turin Polytechnics and the University, is uh, one of the partners, Italian partners in this project. So I'd like to um, have your point of view from a point of view of a scientist, let's say. Um, so I need to change language. Uh, my Italian isn't good enough. I'm here for a while in, in, in Bolzano, but again, on the technical level, I, I prefer to, to, to use English yet. So uh, the, the perspective of the universities, um, uh, clearly, this is a benefit to, to us to, to, to learn, and particularly 5G Carmen, I think, is, is characterized by, by two important uh, dimensions for, for universities, but possibly for all the partners involved. 
Firstly, this is a, a, a clearly a multidisciplinary setting. So we have the, the car manufacturers, we have the telecommunication companies, hardware providers, uh, up to the, the, the software solution there. And this is important to learn from each other. But one particular, let's say, trend that is kind of in, in this space um, kind of signals even the, the need to bring these together. So there's clearly this kind of convergence at the moment that brings let's say, the telecommunications people upwards towards, and um, there would be terms used like softwareization, virtualization, uh, being used to, to bring this more into a my area computer science world. But I can also see, and I'm coming from this, this wider cloud computing area, where we need to get closer to, to what is distribution, uh, to, to what is networking. So we see this kind of conversion, um, things that were often treated separately and in, in English, and I think it even works even in Italian well, we have all of these big C words, communication, collaboration, computation, control, and all of this kind of merges into to one space that we need to now uh, jointly address. So 5G Carmen was simply a, a way of bringing these competences together to learn from each other and then bring this forward into the future. I also mentioned this other uh, dimension which is important for us and, and uh, as, as university or as, as research partners uh, to, 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 to show our responsibility for let's say the, the, let's say the society as a whole. The EU likes this, this, this term of TRL, so technology readiness levels, and, and we typically, obviously, as, as, as research institutions, sit at the, the, the lower end of, of this. Uh, but here we can really learn what makes the difference to bring this into to practice, and actually today we really see this, the effort that goes into bringing technology into, even at the demo stage today, to, to bring all the partners together to, to make this work. And also to, to take a let's say, a, a, a take-home message from, from this is, is um, and, and we heard it, I think Roberto Fantini mentioned this uh, in, in, in his kind of research summary, that there is a difference between what you do in the field, what you do in reality, compared to, to what you can do and achieve and, and, and learn in the, um, let's say, the lab environments, in the, 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 the test bed. And maybe to, to map this into the future a little bit, I think this is what we take home is, is um, uh, as research institutions, but maybe also the other partners, is this, this need for, okay, we already relied a lot on, on simulation here, and this was partly caused by, by COVID not being able to, to come here and, and, and go across the borders in, in, in certain periods when we would have liked to do this. But what comes out of this is um, this kind of the whole digitalization of the world around us. And I might want to bring the term uh, digital twins there. I think we need to move closer to not just kind of simulate and, and simulate the kind of the, the performance, the latency um, aspects of, of, of systems, but to have a holistic perspective and to be able to not only to, to, to monitor, but to analyze, to, to maintain complex systems by having this, this complete digital twin somewhere that we can operate irrespective of whatever is the condition uh, in, in, in the, the, the real world. So there was a lot of art for us to, to learn, and as a computer scientist, of course, uh, steps that are ahead of us is this notion of, let's say, intelligence that we need to bring forward, and maybe also to, to remind you of um, a, a picture that you've seen in the, the research summary where there were these kind of, this architecture, these kind of blocks of things on the, um, the, the mobile edge cloud, the, the Mac layer, where we've just seen terms like orchestration and you know, we were all hidden from the complexity of this. So if we zoom in, we would have seen lots of orchestration links between various different layers. And this is where we see this, this, this kind of mix of computation, communication, uh, bringing us closer, uh, using virtualization from the, the, the radio access network layer up to the mobile edge clouds, to the decentralized clouds, where this now becomes this, this big space that we need to better understand firstly, but also better maintain. And, and there, I'm, I'm hoping this is again one of my take home messages there as an academic um, to, to use this kind of pervasive intelligence approach and, and, and make everything smarter to predict, uh, to, to, to see problems coming before they actually occur. Again, if I can pick up on, on the word that Filippo earlier said on the, let's say, the, we need to look ahead, we need to see what's 
not, not just kind of physically beyond the lorry or the bend on, on the road, but also in, in time we need to find out um, what could be a problem because the, before the problem really becomes a problem. Perfetto, grazie mille. Devo dire che tutti... Well, thank you. Everybody, well, when describing the results of the uh, project, I've already talked about the future, but in my second round of questions, I'd like to focus on the future further because the future is close and we have uh, to do a lot in a limited uh, amount of time. There is a high level of expectation and uh, so uh, we have done a lot uh, um, in this consortium, and I, uh, it would be a pity if uh, all these that have has been done, uh, it would be a pity if it went lost. So, Klaus, I'd like to start from you. Do you have ideas on considering further developments and evolution of this uh, project? Uh, um, well, of course, stressing the uh, role of the academia. The, the, the word digitalization has occurred now throughout the morning several times. So uh, digitalization of infrastructures, what has been in, in telecommunications, mainly really physical hardware becomes software now. And then software becomes essentially or needs to deal with data. So I think I, I see a, a big issue around the management of, of data, be that data that we need to to communicate the car's positions, their velocity, their intentions, but also data that we know, need to know about, let's say, the infrastructure, how well is the infrastructure managing all this is, is doing. So data becomes a, a central issue, and we need to learn better how to, to, to deal with data in, in this space. And I already mentioned this, this idea of pervasive intelligence. Um, data now appears at the, the edge at the, the, the network level and not anymore or is not anymore centralized in, in, in big data centers. So we need to bring intelligence to, to the data and this is one of the, the great challenges because we, we've seen, and this is one of, again, the outcomes of 5G Carmen, uh, data needs to pro, uh, be processed under very, very critical latency and also reliability issues if we think of the autonomous cars. Uh, another issue that, that plays into this is the, the, the security side or the privacy. So we have data that needs to be, be uh, yeah, processed, that needs to be gathered, analyzed, and, and, and put into a kind of fruition in, into some positive benefit uh, under all of these reliability, safety, and, and, and performance issues. And for that, we need to kind of develop, again, more intelligent technologies and that we can even bring into yeah, the to the edge and also considering um, privacy concerns. So machine learning is a big thing in, in, in various domains, but we need to make this really also alive in, in, in the specific space of, of, of edge computing. So we need, uh, again, terms being used like federated learning uh, to, to make clear everything needs to happen in this kind of high performance and high security awareness space. Perfetto, grazie mille. Devo dire che eh, come collega diciamo, del mondo della ricerca mi trovo molto sui commenti fatti. Well, uh, uh, as a colleague, I absolutely share uh, your point of view, and I think this is uh, a very important direction for the future. But now I'm curious, I'd like to um, hear what a tower operator suggests uh, in terms of uh, how we can uh, further evolve uh, the 5G Carmen, this and and, and um, the innovative uh, and its its innovative nature. Well, first of all, we should uh, of course ensure that the ultra broadband reaches the covers the entire territory, and um, so we will have to. Uh, find a technical way to ensure a priority access to uh, radio resources and redundancy because this is a typical service that uh, can, uh, does not is uh, uh, zero fault tolerant so cannot uh, is not fault tolerant at all so we have changed uh, the standard a bit so as to avoid um, latency time and uh, uh, re 
Uh, so we still have to do something in terms of um, coverage, but uh, then security is important. But this huge volume of data that can be uh, exchanged as uh, an element of proximity in the tower in terms of edge computing, uh, edge, uh, uh, mobile edge cloud, so it can run you can avoid running too much data at a remote level. So the tower is uh, looking forward, it could become a, not so much a mini data center, but could have some processing features. And together with the nearby towers, they can exchange data and can become a bigger cloud-based uh, cloud. So then in terms of timing, uh, the deployment of these, uh, uh, of all these should be uh, um, facilitated because our ambition in terms of timing should be support, of course, be supported by regulations. And I think that we should work together with the institutions to have this uh, combination, let's say. Thank you. I will now conclude the second round of table addressing uh, Alessio again and the Bordoni Foundation, because you are a, a third party, so to say, vis-a-vis -vis the project. We have worked together, of course, but you enjoy this third party position and being it so, you can uh, give us all the more suggestions. Uh, could you give the partners in the project suggestions about uh, the way by which uh, we can implement all this and make it real in the next years? Here, I would like to go back to what we said earlier on about uh, the need to involve all stakeholders and actors in the supply chain. They should also be aware of the fact that no one plays alone. This goes for all sector and all the more so for this one. You can't have a, an automotive uh, player going in one direction and another car producer going in another. Uh, of course, uh, each company wants to have a return on the investment and, and wants uh, to have a profit. I believe that there is a business here if, you, if we join efforts, um, if we work together. That is an awareness that we all need to develop. We feel closer to the public, to the state uh, um, sector because we are part of, of it. Basically, we come from there. This is what I mean. But you see, uh, also in relation to the Recover and Resilience Plan and all the other resources that have been made available, they are huge, this amount, and we need to be very clear about what we want to do with these resources, with this money. Uh, you see, the um, Recovery and Resilience uh, Plan has a sort of uh, a silo approach uh, by sector, by ministry, and that is something that I criticize. Digital is something that applies to all ministries. You can change name to it, but it is something which is enabling all sectors in all ministries, which means that we have huge amounts of money at our disposal. Let's use them. Let's invest together, sharing projects. What can happen in the private sector can also uh, happen with uh, public entities at national and local level. Uh, the latter perform a fundamental role. We said that 4G uh, w was something which was very much co consumer oriented, while 5G um, is very local, meaning that it wants uh, to develop uh, uh, local networks. Uh, and uh, local areas, local sectors, individual sectors, there can be the possibility for these local entities to invest. And we need to find a way to stimulate them and to uh, uh, spur them to do so. 
it is a different logic and rational here. We need to invest in infrastructures, as I said, and that is not easy when uh, the public entity uh, m makes an investment. Uh, uh, the public sector has in financed, uh, for instance, uh, the fiber uh, connections at uh, the stations and uh, uh, the white areas have been uh, uh, funded and financed in relation to a general coverage uh, service, uh, thinking in terms of throughput. If we now consider where these uh, white areas are located, where we have shortages vis-à-vis uh, -vis rural areas or road infrastructures and other types of services, then we find other levels of white areas, which means that we need to have uh, this central and local capability uh, uh, of acting, of interacting with the European Commission so that it also finances uh, infrastructures. In addition to that, we need to fund and finance services. 5G Carmen-like uh, actions and initiatives must become operational, and this requires uh, that uh, we implement services and we, that we finance them. Of course, that goes in hand uh, goes hand in hand with the financing and funding of infrastructures. Without infrastructures, you can't achieve anything. That is clear. So. This is the recipe that I think we have to bank on, uh, joining efforts, being part of the same system, sharing projects, and then individual players and entities being able to make their part also through urban and economic planning activities, because that can make a difference at a local level, and competition between areas is a healthy thing. It should be there. There can be a positive repercussion and positive best practices then drive the other areas as well. As I said, I wanted to be brief and we indeed have been brief. Thank you very much to all the speakers for helping me in this um, endeavor. Now I would like to give back the floor to Matteo to draw uh, conclusions. I'm sure that Matteo will thank all the others, but I thank Matteo for this huge amount of work that he has put into uh, creating this, creating uh, this network of cooperation also during the pandemic. It was not easy. Uh, thank you. You met the challenge, uh, wonderful. Um, and you also worked uh, so much to organize this event. And now you, there is the demo. So uh, thank you. The, thank you very much for your uh, work. A round of hand uh, uh, to you and for you. And now you can conclude the meeting, uh, Matteo. Well, I would like to conclude by thank you all. I would like to thank uh, the panelists of the round table. I would like to conclude, uh, as I started, by thanking a number of people. As I said, the speakers, not only of the round table, but all speakers, thank you for your contribution. Thank you for bringing your vision and sharing it with us. I would like to thank uh, the Bruno Kessler Foundation uh, people. Without uh, the uh, communication and uh, event uh, uh, department, we would have never made it. And then thank you to A22 for hosting us and for organizing the day. I would also like uh, to thank uh, uh, all uh, our guests, uh, as is the case with uh, Mr. Spinelli from the Autonomous Province of Trent and Tito Mauri representing the ministry. So, Vito Mauro, sorry. Uh, for representing the Ministry of Infrastructure and Transport. Thank you very much. Um, this is the end of our uh, uh, meeting, and uh, those who are physically present here now will be lucky because they can uh, indeed uh, participate uh, in the demonstration on the road.